Hello and welcome to another episode of the Prop Swap Podcast. We are your hosts, Ian Epstein and Luke Pergandy. And we are also the founders of Prop Swap, the first marketplace to buy and sell sports bets. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We've got another great episode for you. Uh, we will touch on a little NFL Week 13 action, uh, talk about some news uh, in the sports betting um, you know, industry outside of uh, what, what takes place on the field. But first, I thought we had to start with uh, college football. Uh, the playoff is set uh, with, of course, Michigan, Washington, Texas, and Alabama in that order. Uh, before the uh, the Pac-12 championship game, I, I posted a, a graphic uh, on our Twitter that showed the odds for like the top six playoff combinations, uh, and this group is not on the list. So <laughs> this four had odds of greater than ten to one um, enter before before Friday night. Again, I I didn't even I couldn't even find what what the odds of of this four team combination was heading in, into the weekend. But um, these were some odds I did I was able to pull. Uh, these were the highest odds for for each team this season. Uh, Michigan seven to one before the season. Uh, Washington one hundred one before the season. Texas twenty five to one be before the season as well as after the loss to Oklahoma. Um, I made a note. I also gave out Texas on Staker Swap uh, in August, uh, and then Alabama uh, forty five to one after their ten point. Uh, South Florida uh, victory. Um, but I thought I would start with the SEC championship, Luke. Uh, Alabama upset Georgia. Georgia left out of the playoff first loss in two years. Um, it, were, any thoughts or takeaways from that uh, SEC game? It's a great game. That's the best Alabama's looked all season. You know, I clearly that South Florida game, they were horrific and looked good, not great against Texas, but that's the sharpest they've looked for sure on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, trending trending um, in the right direction. Yeah, obviously, yeah, totally agree. Best they've looked all season. Uh, as I said the other week, uh, last week or before, I, I thought their win over Auburn was like the fact that it was that close. I think was just a because they were looking ahead to the game, and I don't think they were as bad as they were against Auburn. But at the same time, I do not think they are as good as how they looked against Georgia. Obviously, Sabe has got an incredible record against his like former you know assistants, um, but. Wanted to bring this sale up, uh, an Alabama sale. So as I mentioned, Alabama, uh, they were 45 to one after the, the South Florida game. So uh, at that time, a prop swap customer placed a $20 bet uh, on the Crimson Tide. So that would collect $920. Before the SEC championship game, uh, that ticket sold on prop swap for $80. So uh, a 4X return there for the, for the seller. After the playoff was announced, that buyer resold the ticket for 263. So that customer who bought for 80 and flipped for 263 after just one game basically got odds of plus 229 uh, on that flip, on that buying and selling uh, around the SEC championship. Odds of plus 229. That's compared to just betting Alabama money line for the game at plus 175. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, we talked about that when we had. Um, uh, uh, Brock on uh, the guest uh, a month or two ago in terms of like sometimes you can make more money by by betting futures or buying on prop swap and then and then reselling than you can just you know betting the the money line of the game uh, and then the the buyer who paid two sixty three got odds of plus two fifty right now on Alabama to win the championship and that's compared to two plus two hundred uh, at sportsbook so um, a nice kind of win win uh, around for everyone yeah yeah. No, great, um, great analysis comparing that because we people ask us all the time whether you're a professional better for professional sports better, an employee at DraftKings, a you know a, a person that's not even in the industry. It's like, well, couldn't you just bet the team's going to win the game instead of buying a future and then selling it on props? Like, we get that question all the time, and in this scenario and many, many, many more, it actually is more profitable to just buy a future and then flip it after a win. Other things have to fall into place. Of course, in this scenario, you know, uh, Bama was on the outside looking in to make that final four. But there's tons of other scenarios where um, if a team advances to the next round of the playoffs and the NBA playoffs, as an example, you actually can make more. Yeah. Um, yeah. We certainly hear the argument of like 
hedging versus selling. Uh, and I think in this case, a lot of people would say, well, why would you even buy that ticket if you were just going to plan and, and sell it, you know, after one mm -hmm. game and, and that's this, the is, this is, this is why, you know, yeah. um, you know, and obviously, uh, they had to make the playoff, which was not a, uh, a guarantee after beating Georgia, um, sports books had Florida state, um, basically favored in terms of like the odds to make it. It, it was, it was a very fluid situation late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, but, um, you know, obviously Alabama ha had to make it for, for, uh, for this, this ticket to, um, to really kind of, you know, to, to hit that. Uh, and then the other matchup from the weekend I wanted to talk about was Washington upsetting Oregon, uh, 10 point underdog. Um, you know, we've talked multiple times on this podcast about this matchup. You, you liked Washington more than I did. Uh, you know, I favored Oregon. I think you still liked Oregon to win the game, but you know, we didn't really get a chance to talk about it. Uh, after, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of stuff went down between when we recorded last week and the game. And by the time the game rolled around, I personally was, was on Washington plus 10. Cause I was like, this is too, I was like, this is too crazy. Like this is an undefeated team and they are getting no respect. Um, and you know, a lot of vibes of, of TCU. Um, I thought in terms of like, look, sometimes these play down to their opponent, but at the end of the day, they find ways to win. And I, I thought the the disrespect level was, was crazy. Um, and really at no point was, was I nervous that Washington was, was going to lose that game. Yeah. Yeah, they got they got close. I want to say early third quarter when uh, Oregon scored like twenty two well, straight points. So that, actually, I, like, I take it back. So there was a point in time where Oregon was up four. Washington had the ball driving like in like deep in Oregon territory, and there was a fumble, uh, and yeah, Oregon Washington, recovered it. Washington was up four. No, I think I think Oregon was up four, and there was a fumble. But then they they reviewed it, and it and it was an incomplete pass. And so they kept the ball and then they scored, retake, retook the lead. And, and then it was kind of right. So like there was, there was, and cause, cause, well, cause I remember I was like, wow, am I really going to lose this plus 10 bet? Um, yeah. If, if they're down four and, and, and have a fumble. Um, so I think that, so Oregon did come back uh, with a great third quarter, but I think it was the, the deficit was too, was kind of too large, but um, you know, any any thoughts or takeaways from, uh, from, from that performance? Yeah. I mean, we talked about it last week. We just, you know, it seemed like the consensus was those odds should have been flipped. Um, maybe it was two weeks ago on the podcast that the odds should have been flipped where Oregon was six to one to win the national championship and UW was 13 to one. And we were just like, that's, that doesn't make sense. Oregon still had to beat Oregon state um, in the, in the rivalry and then um, play, play Washington. So, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. Like we, like you mentioned at the beginning, they were the biggest underdog Washington was at 101. So we root for underdogs and I'm, I'm very happy. They they're there. I mean, gun to my head. If you asked me who I would like to win the CFP, it's not Washington. Obviously a little bit of PAC 12 relevance, but just, we always want dogs. So I'm rooting for them. Yeah. Well, uh, if you thought that, uh, that $200, 101 Huskies ticket was a, was a big ticket. I, I got another one for you. Um, we have a customer uh, who is holding a an interesting parlay. He back in May, uh, they bet uh, a twenty five dollar three leg parlay on the following: Texas Rangers to win the World Series at eighteen to one, Baltimore Ravens to win the Super Bowl at twenty to one, and Washington to win the CFP at forty five to one. If the ticket wins, it will collect four hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars off a twenty five dollar bet. Uh, and right now that ticket is worth $7,200. Uh, and so, you know, just like against Oregon, I feel like Washington is once again being overlooked. Uh, and so would you sell this ticket right now or uh, try and hedge by betting Texas? Or you could also, uh, like FanDuel, for example, is offering a no on Washington to to win the CFP at minus 1400, uh, you know, and then if, if UW does win the title, you can then sell it with just the, uh, the Ravens leg remaining who are currently six to one to, to win the Super Bowl. So, you know, if you're feeling like Washington is still being overlooked, they're eight to one right now, still, uh, to win the championship. Um, would you sell the full thing right now or, or, or try and hedge on, you know, by on bank Texas money line or, or that? No, I was talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm mean, obviously I'm biased here, but I would flip it and then just go rebet, um, that parlay, you know, Ravens and Washington and put, you know, so say you sell for 7,200, 
put uh, put two k in your pocket and then put five k right back on that parlay. That's fair. Yeah, and obviously it all comes down to like how much liquid cash do you have uh, mm-hmm. as a, a twenty five dollar better. Um, but no, that's a that's a great point. Uh, and then just the last note, you know, this has been talked about ad nauseum and last you know since the playoff came out, Florida State undefeated wins the ACC outright uh, and and gets left out. Uh, and look, we, we don't need to talk about it for, for too long because there's plenty of, of podcasts out there that are, that are discussing it. But it stinks. But as someone who, you know, just want to watch, just wants to watch good games, uh, competitive games, obviously, um, this affects our business to a certain degree. But Florida State's a 14 and a half point underdog to Georgia. So, you know, yeah, you know, did they deserve... Yeah, but like at the end of the day, they would get scraped by by you know whoever they would play in the in the in the semifinals. Totally. Yeah. So my I've talked about this a bunch over the weekend. My response would be look, we're in the entertainment business. We are not in the sports business. You are selling TV advertisements to you know Michigan to play um Florida State, just an example. Let's say we put them in at four. Um, that would not be a well watch game because Michigan would roll them. And uh, furthermore, if they had came out with their backup and w- destroyed Florida and they came out of their backup again and destroyed Louisville, I think they still get in. Yeah. Right. Like, I think they just looked uh, so anemic in both of those games that the committee's like, look, like this team stinks now without the Heisman hopeful, their quarterback, Travis, like, uh, you just, they had opportunities is my point. Like I, now having said all that, if I was a Florida state Seminole, I'd be beside myself. I get it. Yeah. Like I would be really, really upset if that was my alma mater, but my response to be, you had two chances to look sharp and you didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally agree. I mean, I think they would be lucky to put up 10 points against Michigan's defense yeah. uh, if they, if they made it. Uh, but plenty of time to uh to talk about that college football playoff uh that will be happening on new year's day and then of course this is the last year of four teams next year at this this time next year we'll, we will be talking about a 12 team playoff um and maybe maybe in a future episode we'll get into what that 12 team playoff would have looked like because you know that would have solved a lot of these uh you know should they or shouldn't they have been uh left out uh but switching gears wanted to talk a little nfl um the main headlines from week 13 49ers absolutely throttle the Eagles uh, in Philly. 49ers back to being Super Bowl favorites. And now Brock Purdy is the favorite at DraftKings to win MVP uh, at plus 300. He was 35 to 1 uh, a month ago. Uh, and then the other headline, I think, is the Chiefs losing to the Packers. They have now lost three of their last five games, and they're currently the four seed uh, in the AFC. Uh, were recorded this before the Jags take on the Bengals, but assuming the Jags win that game, um, Chiefs are the the lowest ranked uh, division, you know, leader uh, at the moment. So, um, what was your kind of number one takeaway from uh, Week 13? Yeah, you nailed it. Um, I'll talk more about the Packers and Staker Swap, but they looked good. They looked really good. Um, and yeah, absolutely, the Niners <laughs> destroyed the Eagles. I think the issue for the Eagles, and this has not been a this is not a new issue, is that their DBs are just not great at coverage, and Debo just roasted them. And um, you know, yeah, that those are the two takeaways. Packers look good. Eagles looked had weaknesses in the defensive secondary. Yeah, um, you're not gonna say I had this, but I kind of been having. I kind of had this. I mean. We I've been staking the 49ers uh, mm-hmm. all year yeah. long. I s- swapped the Eagles last week. Um, I think the 49ers are the class of the NFC and, and the entire league. Uh, that losing streak they went on, you know, just uh, they were hurt. Debo was out. Trey Williams was out. They needed that bye week really badly. They got that bye week. And, you know, they've against the other two best teams in the NFC, the Cowboys and the Eagles, they have beat them by like a combined like 300 points. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you had... And you had Michigan too. You're hot these last few weeks. Michigan, Texas, yeah. No, we're we're uh, we're back. We're back on the uh, on a winning streak here a little bit. Um. So yeah, uh, more to come on the Packers. Um. And uh, other NFL action uh, coming up in Stake or Swap. Uh. But before that, 
Uh, I thought we'd talk a little more industry news. Uh, I thought this was super interesting. And, you know, as more states legalize and and just legal sports betting in this country uh, continues to spread, this is going to become a more and more prevalent thing, or at least a, a bigger topic of conversation. And um, I thought I thought it'd be interesting we talk about it. So back on October 24th, uh, there was an error on DraftKings Sportsbook caused by a third-party vendor uh, that they use for same-game parlays. That, that vendor is called uh, Sportcast. The error was for a Lakers-Nuggets matchup where uh, players' first quarter over-under points got posted as their over-under for the game. So, for example, LeBron's point total over-under was listed at 8.5 for the game when that should have been the, the first quarter over-under. Uh, word spread about this error on a Reddit thread, and in 13 minutes, hundreds of SGPs were placed across the country. Uh, DraftKings tried voiding all of the SGPs that contain these errors, um, but basically each state has to, like the state's game commission has to like approve or deny if they can actually void those tickets. Uh, New Jersey and Connecticut rejected uh, DK's request uh, for the voids, which resulted in about $150,000 in payouts to betters. But the biggest decision uh, for the company was in Massachusetts, where they would have been on the hook for $575,000. Last week, over like a two-day, it was like a two-day conversation meeting uh, amongst the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Um, the commissioners, which is a group of five, voted three to two to approve DK's request for the voiding, uh, which resulted in DraftKings only having to give uh, 138 customers three times their initial stake. Uh, one of the MGC commissioners uh, who approved the voiding said, quote, I can't stomach enriching a group of people that were taking advantage of the system, end quote. So Luke, I will ask you, uh, fair or foul for states to allow a sports book to void bets based on a sports book error? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go with uh, fair. I think it is fair that the MGC allowed the sports book to void it because it is an obvious error. The there's a difference between an obvious error and you knowing more than the sports book. Silly example here. You know who's you know not a silly example, but like you know injury information in a college football game. You take advantage of it. The sports book didn't know it. You win your bet. I think you absolutely should get paid for that. You did a better job of collecting information than the sports book did. In this situation, they literally just made a fat finger. It was a obvious error of making a um, quarter line, the total game line. So I, I side with the regulators saying that you could refund that specific bet. So you, you said something there about like, you know, you know the difference between, you know, what's an obvious, you know, but like an obvious error and a, and a real mm -hmm. line. And that's kind of where I, 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 I disagree because how, how, as a better, you know, where, I mean, I, I, I can, in this example, I can see, I can see that, but like, um, there was a story one time, uh, a, pro, a customer of ours uh, said this to me. He was, uh, he, he was betting golf at a sports book and he bet a certain golfer to win a tournament uh, at 2000 to one. And the sports book basically like the next time he tried like log into his account or, or I, I think it was like log into his account. He had like, he got like, he was, he was blocked. And some of the sports book basically said like that line should have been 200 to one. That was a fat finger. So like either you can keep the bet and you can never bet with us again, or uh, we can void the bet and you can stay, uh, stay on. Um, and you know, again, it's like, how is he supposed to, you know, 2001 is, is a much bigger number than 201, but how is he supposed to know that that's a mistake, right? So mm -hmm. the line of like, oh, you're supposed to know, it's like, it's a very, that line can move, right? And so now it's like, next time there's something like this happens where like, it's not that obvious. Now there's a precedent that, that, that has been set. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, what if LeBron rolled his ankle in the in the first minute of the of the first quarter, you know, and or like mm -hmm. and and left the game and you know yeah, had under eight and a half point. points? Do you do you think do you think the sports books would be would be void, you know, giving refunds? No, probably not. Right. Great point. Great point. Definitely agree with that. Um, 
Yeah. And the 201 and 2001, that's also a very fair point. Um, yeah, I don't agree with that scenario. I think that's the better is, you know, just clearly betting a long shot. And in this situation, arguably the greatest basketball player that ever lived, like obviously he's his over under should be more than eight and a half points for points score in the whole game. But I agree with you. If it went the other way, the sports books will not be saying, Hey, like we sure we had to pay, the, you know, uh, pay the unders. Yeah. And the other thing too, and this is a complete guess. I, I, I don't know this to be uh, true at all, but I wonder if the, the sheer dollar amount swayed some of these decisions in some of these States. Right. So mm-hmm. like I mentioned, New Jersey and Connecticut, Re- rejected the the voids, uh, which I think New Jersey has been pretty good about that historically, but I could be yeah. wrong. But yeah, the combined amount between those two states was one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and in Massachusetts alone, it was five hundred seventy five thousand dollars. And so it's like I almost wish that the commissioners were presented with this question without knowing the dollar mm-hmm. amount, right? It's mm-hmm. just, it's, we're just talking sheer principle here, and you know, I'm sure DraftKings said, "Look, like," and I, I saw a screenshot of one of them. I mean, it's again, I think. I saw the the total bet amount on those Massachusetts tickets was like four thousand dollars, and it would have resulted in a five hundred seventy five thousand dollar payout. So, like, I'm sure DraftKings was showing like how little these people wagered, you know, to win, you know, win this much. And I feel like, again, just a guess that somehow like trickled into the decision making process, where it's like, well, like, you know, these guys only bet ten bucks to win five thousand. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not fair. But if if it was an error where it was a five thousand dollar bet to win five thousand or DraftKings total liability was much lower than the the five hundred seventy five thousand dollar number that would have swayed their decision. And I, I just feel like you can't like it's got to be a principle based thing. And and now there's precedent, right? Like moving forward, mm-hmm. if something this happens again, Massachusetts has set the precedent that that you know the sports books if the if the sports book says this was an, an obvious error, then they get to avoid it, right? Agreed. Um. So. You know, definitely an interesting thing to um, to just keep paying attention to. Uh, and then just, I mean, the last thing I'll just say is I, I wonder where where that third party vendor comes into this, right? I mean, like, um, are the are they done? You know, should they be held liable for this? I mean, really, it's the it's the third party error, but obviously, as the sports book, you when you hire them, you you take that on. Yeah, um, I, guarantee, I guarantee that's sussed out when they sign a contract. Like, of course, some lawyer DraftKings is going to say, "Hey, if you guys hang a wrong number, who's at fault here?" Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so before we get into, uh, into stake or swap, uh, time for a little trivia or, or as I like to call it, Luke learns, um, we're talking, we're talking back to uh, college football here. Uh, so on Saturday, uh, in route to their big 12 championship win, Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers passed for 452 yards. That is the third most in a single game in Texas school history. Second all time is Colt McCoy with 470 yards. Who is the all time Texas leader for most passing yards in a game? Vince Young. Uh, that is uh, not correct. Uh, the all time leader Tex- uh, in Texas school history for most passing yards a game is Major Applewhite. <laughs> Major Applewhite. Glad, glad we did this. I- <laughs> um. But uh, Colt McCoy is is first all time in uh, in passing yards. Do you want to take a a wild stab at at who's number two all time, like a uh, career passing yards? Yeah, it's someone I, I, someone recent. Yeah, I'm racking my brain for other Texas quarterbacks that I can think of. I don't know. I'll give you a hint. He's he he kind of went viral for uh, winning a, the Alamo Bowl and going, "We're back." I don't know. Uh, Sam Ellinger. Oh, who uh, yeah. got drafted by the Colts? Mm-hmm. So, um, Major Applewhite. Yeah, I I, re- I remember him. Um, and you can't really forget that name. Uh, but thank you for uh, for playing along. Um, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll get it. We'll get him next time. Uh, we'll we'll go we'll go easier. We'll go easier next time. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Um, now it is that time of the show for steak or swap. <laughs> First up, we will be talking about the Buffalo Bills, currently 50 to 1 to win the Super Bowl over at DraftKings. Uh, I will go first. I am staking uh, the Bills to win the Super Bowl right now. 
Uh, currently, they're, they're 10th in the a- AFC and plus 360 to make the playoffs. But if you look at the wildcard teams above them, uh, you got the Steelers who are on their second string QB, the Browns who are on their second string QB. In fact, you know, rolled out Joe Flacco uh, out there on Sunday. Uh, Colts on their second string QB, and the Texans who just lost their second best receiver in Tank Dell, and the Broncos who actually kind of like. But my point here is though is that the wild card teams above them are not exactly. I may not have the the best rest of their season. Uh, the Bills are fifth in points per game, fourth in yards per play. Their defense is fifth in points allowed. Uh, the Bills are third in EPA, which is like this like advanced metric stat called uh, expected points added. Um, their six losses this year have been by an average of four points. So this is a solid football team coming off a uh, a bye week that I think was desperately needed. And if they can get into the playoffs, they will be very dangerous. Uh, but they just got to start winning these these close games. Uh, and so you know, fifty to one right now on a really good team that just you know is going to have to obviously start their playoffs very soon. Here, um, I'm I'm staking the Bills. Totally agree. I'll stake them as well. Don't trust the AFC at all. Um, It seems like the Chiefs, seems like their receivers are finally biting them. I don't have a good answer to how they solved it last year and obviously won the Super Bowl with this group of receivers, but they're underperforming. I think the O-line isn't performing as well as they were last year. So they got some problems, and that's the cream of the crop for the AFC. I've, I've talked ad nauseum of my concerns for Tua um, to lead the Dolphins to success just because of his past injury risk. So I agree, man. I still have enough faith in the Bills. Like you said, I mean, the Steelers are, are slotted to get in. The Browns, the Steelers might be the worst 7-5 to five team in the history of the NFL. They're a joke. Um, Browns are not going to get in. Colts look good. I still don't trust them. Maybe that's the team of, like, that is better than I currently am giving credit to. Like they're actually pretty good. Like I don't really have a good answer to how they, um, to why I don't think they're good. I just don't trust them enough with Gardner, but they're a solid team. Texans look great. Um, but I think the bills will edge out the Broncos. So, and then Steelers Browns certainly out. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously a huge game this week, uh, bills chiefs. Um, and but yeah, I think I listen, it's really hard to read to, to repeat as, as a champ. And um, all those things you said about the Chiefs, I think, are, are correct. Um, but look, with these Bills, the Bills got to start winning these, these one possession games. Um, yeah, I mean, to have all, all of your losses come at an average of four points, uh, that's 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 crazy. But the last thing I'll say is, uh, I mentioned that that plus 360 to make the playoffs, I think that's a that's a good sprinkle, uh, that there, there as well, just to mm-hmm. plus 360 just to get one of those, you know, um three wildcard spots. Yeah. Um, and then moving over to the NFC, uh, another team that's, uh, that's uh, fighting for a wildcard spot right now. Uh, the Green Bay Packers currently 90 to one to win the Super Bowl uh, over at FanDuel. Uh, Luke, you can go first. Are you staking or swapping uh, the Packers? Yeah. So you can find them a 90 to one at FanDuel and then 66 to one at Bet MGM. So from that perspective alone, I would stake the Packers, but I honestly believe in this team. I, we talked early on about them and how great they've, they improved, how greatly they improved in the off season. It's like ironic. They not all of a sudden pick all these receivers in the draft and it's the year that Rogers leaves totally. like on him. I'd be so pissed. Um, so with Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks, I learned a lot of new names watching the game on Sunday night. Um, but I knew they picked a lot of receivers. This is Jordan Love's first season. So as we always talk about, like in the NBA, when superstars come together, you know, Durant moves a team or, you know, AD, LeBron, whatever it is, like it takes a little bit to gel when superstars move in the NBA. And same thing here in the NFL, when a, a young quarterback is having his first season, it takes time. So let's give them some time. 90 to one is great value. I don't think this team wins the Super Bowl, but my goodness, 90 to one is is excellent to flip once they get locked into the playoffs. Uh, currently slotted to make the playoffs, so no no issue there. Um, and then, of course, like you said, there's four, the four division winners get in plus three wild cards this year. I don't trust the Vikings. I, I don't like them at all. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it will be uh, Packers, Rams, Seahawks to get in, and that's all you need to do. Just get in the dance and maybe make get an upset or two. Uh, yeah, uh, I will uh, stake the Packers as well. Uh, I think we were both on them 
you know, before the season, early in the season. Um, I, I liked the the makeup of this team. Uh, to your point, obviously, you know, maybe some growing pains there early in the season, but they have now won what uh, four out of the last five games. Twenty three against the Packers, lost to the to the Steelers, but then Chargers, Lions, Chiefs. They've, they've now won in a row. Their upcoming schedule is Giants, Bucks, Panthers, Vikings, Bears. That that's that that's their remaining schedule. Crazy. So some very winnable games there. Like you said, they're they're slot the playoff right now. I think they're they're minus two fifteen right now to make the playoffs. So um you will not find a team in the playoffs at ninety to one um you know no uh, on the on the Super Bowl odds. So um yeah, I, I like this team. The, the defense is is playing well. Uh, you know, they're currently like top ten in, in points allowed and 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 yards allowed, I, I believe. So um I'm still yeah, no I'm, I'm still no Aaron Jones too. You know, once he comes back, that'll be a nice boost. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, you know, these receivers who we're all learning their names right now, but they're all, I mean, and you know, Christian Watson, obviously he was hurt kind of begin the year slow. Um, he's been playing really well, kind of a freak injury there at the end of the game. Uh, I don't think it had anything serious, but, um, I think, yeah, Watson's super solid. And, and if love can keep up this momentum and the comp, the, it's all about the confidence. Like when he, you know, uh, when he makes some of these throws, um, it's, you know, he, they can, they can win a lot of these games. So, and also, uh, that stat about the floor is like 15 and 0 in December, like 12 and 0 in December. That's, that's, that's crazy. Um, so yeah, I, I will stake the, uh, the Packers as well. So that will do it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and we will talk to you next week. 